Welcome Colonies family. As of today, we have met as many Sundays online and in the parking lot as we have in person in the year 2020. And I have to admit, whenever we, we made the decision to close the doors of our building, I could not have imagined that we would still be doing this at the end of May. It has truly been an exercise in patience. Knowing how these would be trying times for us, we began a study earlier in this month that I have titled, Pause, Learning to Wait on God. Because hardships become a, a sort of testing ground for our faith as we, we wrestle with a lot of questions. Those questions intensify as time passes and we wonder if we have been forgotten. Memory is filled with mystery. Our memory systems are beautiful in their elegance and complexity, but they are frustrated and fallen like everything else in this world. Sometimes it, it's a struggle just to remember the everyday details of life, what we have to do and where we need to go. We forget things or people more often than we like to admit. Like the story of an elderly husband and a wife that visited their, their doctor when they began forgetting little things. Their doctor tells them that, that many people find it useful to write themselves little notes. Well, when they got home, the wife says, Honey, will you please go to the kitchen and get me a, a dish of ice cream? And, and maybe write it down so that you won't forget. Nonsense, says the husband. I can remember a dish of ice cream. Well, says the wife, I, I'd also like some strawberries and whipped cream on it. The husband says, my, my memory is not all that bad. So no problem. A dish of ice cream with some strawberries and whipped cream. I don't need to write it down. He goes into the kitchen. His wife hears some pots and pans banging around. And the husband finally emerges from the kitchen and presents his wife with a plate of bacon and eggs. She looks at the plate and asks, Hey, where's the toast that I asked for? <laughs> See, we can laugh at our faltering memories, but there is often real pain behind those smiles. The forget-me-not flower speaks of our strong desire to be loved and remembered. According to one legend of how the, the name came about for the flower, a young knight was walking along a river with his beloved when she spotted the, the beautiful flowers on the bank. Wanting to please her, he stooped down to pick up the flowers. Just as he pulled them out of the ground, he stumbled into the river. Unable to swim because of the weight of the the armor he was wearing, he tossed the bouquet onto the, the bank. And before being swept away, he declared his love and shouted, Forget me not! And said that she wore the flowers in her hair for the rest of her days in honor of her love. Well, when reading the stories of Scripture, I, I think it is easy to simply not notice how often People wait on God, wondering if they have been forgotten. Heroes of faith that we have looked at like Peter, Abraham, Ruth, Naomi, and Joseph spend lengthy periods of time waiting on God to act, wrestling with, with what faithfulness looks like in that, that meantime. A few weeks ago, we talked about Abraham's up and downs, his decisions and the consequences of those on the people around him, including his wife. And this morning, I want to turn our attention to her. Sarah's introduction includes the, the biggest problem that she will face and the, the test of her faith. Now, Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive Women have long been defined by their ability to produce children. Through modern medicine, we understand that both 
The man and the woman can have issues with their reproductive systems that contribute to the problem. In ancient times, women bore that responsibility alone. Most of the time when Sarah is introduced in Genesis, the qualifier of being childless is attached. That problem is compounded by the promise given to her husband that he will be the father of many nations. Noticeably absent from that promise is who the mother will be. Perhaps that is why she goes along with the plan to become a wife to the Pharaoh in order to save Abraham. And it most certainly was the motivation behind her own plan in Genesis 16. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah had said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Scholars have been able to piece together from ancient documents some of the cultural practices in response to infertility. And according to Jewish rabbinic teaching, 10 years of barrenness was considered grounds for divorce. So it became acceptable to use maidservants to produce offspring that would then be recognized as the child of the wife to save the marriage. We see this played out in other stories like uh, in Genesis with Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. What Sarah proposes was socially acceptable and the plan serves its purpose. Hagar becomes pregnant and will soon give birth to a son, but that does not mean that all is well. Conflict ensues. It it appears that Hagar despised Sarah and began to treat her with contempt. I know that that many view the, the sexual ethic of Scripture, meaning sexual intimacy between one man and one woman within the boundaries of marriage, as antiquated and restrictive. However, anyone who has read the Bible closely knows that that God is not a prude who is trying to prevent us from enjoying the pleasure of sex. Instead, God, as in all areas of life, wants what's best for us. Breaking the boundaries of the sexual relationship, in other words, sin, increases the likelihood of bringing trouble on ourselves and those around us. Even though this was Sarah's idea, she blames her husband. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. While searching for answers to the questions that that fills her mind, while she waits for God to act on the promise, Sarah begins to blame others for her problems. Blaming others can be a way of coping with the anxiety of our longings. It gives us an explanation for why we are suffering and waiting. Some of us don't like to to put the blame off onto others. We like to blame ourselves. Anything that goes wrong, we are convinced that we deserve it. Now, we may not use that strong of a language, but we will make promises to God, bargaining our behavior for His goods and services. We need to, to feel in control or that we have earned God's favor or his remembrance. But God would visit Abraham and Sarah to confirm his promise. Abraham would indeed become a father, and this time he adds that Sarah would be the mother. 
Abraham and Sarah were already very old. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and old, it, will I now have this pleasure? Sarah has felt forgotten for years. And now God remembers her? What, what she has heard is not humanly possible. But she is going to learn that God is a God who delights in the impossible. Because one year later, God will visit Sarah again. And Sarah became pregnant. She bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him when his son Isaac was eight days old. Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Sarah teaches us that our faith might not be perfect, but God's faithfulness to us always is. One day, Charles Spurgeon was walking through the English countryside with a friend. As they, they strolled along, the, the preacher noticed a, a barn with a weather vane on its roof. At the top of the, the vane were these words, God is love. When Spurgeon saw that, he remarked to his friend that, that he thought this was rather inappropriate place for such a message. Weather vanes are changeable, he said, but God's love is constant. I, I don't agree with you about those words, Charles, replied his friend. You misunderstood the meaning. That sign is indicating a truth regardless of which way the wind blows. God is love. See, we, we may dismiss the story of a woman becoming pregnant in her 90s by saying that they lived longer then, so they must have remained fertile longer. Or just simply as one of those strange things that happens. But Sarah knows it was God that has brought her laughter. The New Testament affirms this, that, that she became pregnant because of God's faithfulness, saying, And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise, and so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars and, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. While we have limited control of what we remember, God is in complete control of what he remembers. You are one thing that God chooses never to forget. In Isaiah 49, God says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Sarah likely had good reason to believe she was forgotten. She has waited a long, long time. Life has been difficult for her. She knows her own sinfulness, but none of that changes who God is. There is another legend behind the origin of the forget-me-not flowers. In this legend, God stopped in the Garden of Eden beside a blue flower and asked it its name. The shy flower whispered that he had forgotten its own name. God renamed the flower as forget-me-not, saying that he will never forget this flower. I like to imagine God saying something like that to Sarah following the birth of Isaac. And surrounded by our flawed memories, I would like each of you to be certain of that as well. That he 
whispers those words to you that he will never forget you. Maybe you need to repeat this to yourself each day. Write it down. Ask a friend to remind you of this truth. No matter what happens to you, God cannot and will not forget you. He has engraved you on the palms of his hands. Will you let me pray for you? Our Father, as we wait for you to answer the prayers to heal our loved ones, as we wait during this pandemic, doubts flood our minds, and we know how, how short our memories are. We ask that you would remember us, that you would give us the confidence that we need to know that you will never forget us. That you, through Christ, have engraved our names on your hands. And I pray this through his name. Amen. If you are prepared to take communion, I want to encourage you to do that now. And if, if you want to know uh, how to become in Christ so that those... That those your name is engraved on his hands. You can contact us through the, the, the means that are up on your screen.